Welcome to the Dark Zone, an adventure racing podcast. <laughs> There's just something about being disconnected and relying on your own skills and relying on your own instincts. It, it's just a, it's a really empowering feeling when you make it to the other side of that. And again, you just come out a different person. You grow, you grow and you grow and you grow. Okay. You people sit tight, hold the fort, and keep the home fires burning. And if we're not back by dawn, call the president. You're going the wrong way! What? You're going the wrong way! He says we're going the wrong way. Oh, he's drunk. How would he know where we're going? Yeah, how would he know? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Welcome to the Dark Zone Adventure Racing Podcast. This is your host, Brian Gatens. Welcome to episode number 86. What makes this one interesting is that this was recorded in December 2022 with Amanda Boli. Fantastic episode. She did a great job and it languished. It sat in the can. Didn't do anything with it. That was my fault. I recently pulled it out and it is a fantastic episode. Now, to listen to it effectively, you have to go back in time a little bit. And when Amanda discusses the national championships, she's not talking Vermont, where she came in second this year. She's talking California, where she came in second that year. Also, she mentions the Endless Mountain Adventure Race, the 2022 version. This year, she raced at 2023 and did very well, coming in fifth place with no complaints. So get in the time machine, take a step back. Amanda Boli is a fantastic adventure racer. She's a human stoke machine. She loves racing. She loves her entry to it. And this is a really, really good episode. So thank you to you all for being patient. Thank you to Amanda for being patient. She will be back on again as a future guest. And I assure you, Dark Zone Nation, she will not have to wait a year to hear her excellent episode. Thank you to Jade Eagles from Wealth Garden Financial Services for sponsoring this episode. Jade is a fellow adventure racer who first started in Australia 15 years ago and recently completed the World Championship in South Africa. His other passion is helping individuals and their families establish a positive relationship with money and partnering with his clients to plan for a financially secure future. To learn more about Jade and his financial planning practice, The Wealth Garden, please visit www.thewealthgardenfs.com and drop him a note. That's www.thewealthgardenfs.com. As a listener of The Dark Zone, you know that we support Ascend Athletics. We encourage everyone to head over to ascendathletics.org and check out their new initiative called Invest in Her, an investment in the future of girls in places where access is limited. Ascend Athletics does a great job working with young women in Afghanistan and Pakistan through education, climbing, and other opportunities. We encourage all of our listeners to visit ascendathletics.org and check out Invest in Her. Thank you for being a listener, and thank you for supporting Ascend. And remember, Ascend pays nothing for this sponsorship. We like what they do and are proud to pass along word of their good work. Today we're joined by Amanda Boli. Amanda is a new racer, newer to the adventure racing scene, but in her relatively short AR career, she's really jumped in with both feet, uh, covered a lot of races, uh, nationals, multi-day stuff. Um, Amanda was kind enough to come on the podcast to talk a bit about her experience and where she's from. So Amanda, thanks for coming on to Dark Zone. Start with, tell us a bit about yourself. What's your athletic background? How'd you get into this? All right. Uh, Thanks for having me, Brian. Um, I'm a big fan of your content, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have a background in a little bit of everything endurance wise, um, trail running, you know, like all trail marathons, 50 Ks. Um, Prior to adventure racing, I was really into just mountain biking. So it was adventure racing really fits the mold for me as far as things that I love to do. Um, I've ridden my bike across the country, um, all all sorts of things. Uh, and as far as adventure racing goes, I work in an office where up until probably five years ago, we used to do, uh, six to 12 hour road games for just like office build team building events. (laughs) Wait a minute. So like, so for an office 
team building event, you would just sort of go out for six to 12 hours. So what office do you work in? Yeah, I work for a, it's a tier one supplier to Honda called Newman Technology. Um, and uh, it's a rad group of guys that work there also. Um, and so, yeah, every November there was a small organization in Ohio that used to do like six to 12 hour row gains. And I had never heard of it. And that's just what we did to get to know each other better. And, you know, we would, looking back on it, it probably looked hilarious to the people who were there, like actually racing because we're in a pod of like 10 to 15 people just, you know, thinking around in the woods, basically. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of how I learned of adventure racing. And I, it wasn't until I'm, I'm not quite the person that, um, Fiji, the eco challenge Fiji propelled into adventure racing, but I had heard of adventure racing. And then Fiji kind of was like, wait a second, you already love mountain biking too. Like, why are you not doing this basically? And so from there, I made a commitment to do my first true adventure race, which was the Shenandoah Epic in 2021. So it's, it sounds like you were uh, a situation that you, you had this background in, in racing, you know, and I will come back to this in a second. I like that you casually dropped into that you rode your bike across the country. Like you mentioned it, like, you know, I work in an office for my bike across the country. So clearly you had a background in endurance sports. You enjoyed those kinds of runnings. You, for fun, your office would go do row games, you know, not exactly a day of bowling. And then you came across Fiji, <clears throat> very common uh, thing we hear on the on the on the dark zone is that people watch Fiji and you know during COVID that was huge for us right it dropped in 2020 and everybody had a chance to watch it and it brought you into adventure racing. Before we get into your AR career, let's just back it up a little bit. You you talked about the idea that you were always involved in these activities. Talk us a bit about the going across the country on your bicycle. Was that an organized trip? Did you do it on your own, east to west? How long did it take you? Oh boy, it was. Definitely not organized. It was, I just decided one day that I was going to do it. I was not too far out of college and just, I don't know, just felt the urge to do it. So I uh, strapped on a tent and a backpack and just <laughs> took off. Um, no knowledge of anything as far as gear goes, or, you know, I bought a set of maps from the Adventure Cycling Association and did what's known as the Trans America route. Is that the um, northern one? That's like the northern part. Yeah, it goes, uh, well, it kind of like starts in Virginia, then it cuts a little bit low into like Kansas, Colorado, and then it goes north into Wyoming, um, up through Yellowstone. Yellowstone's actually where I ended my trip. I had met my grandparents who were vacationing there and hitched to ride back. But um, yeah, so like it was that trip that kind of like opened my mind to what, not only what I'm physically capable of, but just how awesome it is to be outdoors, like all the time, spending all day, every day, um, sleeping outside. And I also attribute that trip to where I got comfortable with being uncomfortable. So it was an incredible experience. I do it again in a second, probably with better gear though. Well, right. And that's the, and in many ways you're an adventure racer without even realizing it, right? The the idea of having a, a map in your hand and having an open road in front of you and having a modicum of gear, right? Enough to get you going and off you started, right? And, and off you went. And were you solo or did you go with a group? I went by myself. Okay. Just one day, right? Just that you have time and opportunity and it's great to be in your twenties, I'm assuming after college yeah. and, and, and go and have at it. So what did you learn? The, the uncomfortable part of that, of that experience it clearly helps to inform your adventure racing right now, right? All the pieces matter. They all come together. What did you learn on that trip that you think you applied over to your adventure racing? Oh boy. I like so much, um, just long days, like eventually come to an end, you know, like, uh, regardless of how hard it is or regardless of the wind straight at your face for 12 hours straight, eventually like that day and that mileage is going to come to an end and you, and uh, you can start fresh. And so that's something that I always keep in mind in races. And it's a little different depending on the length of race, as you know, but uh, like everything ebbs and flows, right. I guess. And the more you stay with it and the more you stay in it, the more just comfortable you get with even even the hardships that come your way, 
And prior to doing that, you mentioned the 50 Ks and the other endurance. What came first? Like when you were going through your teenage years and into college, did you dip your toe in the athletic water or did it take off after college? After college, really. After I college. mean, I think I ran a half marathon in college just to see what I could do. Um, and that's kind of been my journey. Um, just like, oh, I ran a half marathon. Check the box. Oh, I ran a marathon. Check the box. Oh, I ran a 50K. Check the box. And then it, it wasn't until adventure racing where it's just like, oh, I did this, but like, now I want to do it really well. And exactly. now I want to do it all the time <laughs> right? and in every form of it possible. And so, and so clearly you were just, you were a pile of kindling waiting to be on fire, right? You clearly yeah. had, you had, you were interested in the, act, in the activity. You had tested yourself in this solo event of riding your bicycle, you know, all the way out to Yellowstone and you went east to west, correct? So you went into the sun and went into the wind. Yep, that's correct. Okay. Although yeah. everybody will say the wind goes both ways in Kansas. Right. But I heard the wind goes always in Kansas, right? Yeah. But you, you made it. You said something before that was really important. It's nice for the listeners to hear that you had a sense of the possibility. Like, because you did that hard thing, you said to yourself, what, what other hard things are out there? And you kind of stair step your way up that. And then it sounds like Fiji kind of met your life experience. And next thing you know, adventure racing took off from there. Yeah, I think that's, that's fair to say. Um, I, like I said, I had heard of adventure racing before, but also at the, t- the timing of Fiji too, like in 2020, like the turbulence of 2020, like it just um, motivated me a little bit to do, to find what else I was capable of. You know, like, I feel like the, the older I get, the more that that question just lingers or like, what actually are my limitations? And I'm just like on this epic quest to find that out. Yeah. Just keep poking in it. And so far, like, I haven't come across a wall that didn't move at least a little bit. Recognizing that you have potential is in one way is it's a blessing. It's a curse, right? It's a blessing because you recognize that you could be more than you currently are and you could do other things. And it's a curse because you know, you could do other things and you kind of chase those things down. Mm. You've jumped into pretty deeply into the deep end of adventure racing with multiple day racing and things like that. Before we get into the experience of racing over the course of multiple days, when you moved into adventure racing, you mentioned Shenandoah Epic in, in, in 2021. I'm correct, right? That was your first your first adventure race. Yeah. What was your experience like compared to what you thought you were going to have that first race? Oh man, I I had I was really well trained for that race. And so like physically I felt okay. I had never done an event up to 24 hours. So it was like Dum. I've never moved for 24 hours, although I did a lot of training that would (laughs) um, get me close to that. And um, so getting there, it was more just like, have I done enough? And uh, I learned that like, yeah, I did plenty. And I ended the race with like almost full gas tanks. And I just, I was almost haunted by that after that race, like how much I had left out there. And that seems to be a theme of my life too. Sometimes, <laughs> like at least when it comes to racing, I'm always just like, I prepare and I prepare and I prepare. And then I do something that I'd never done before, like a 24 hour race. And then, um, I don't know what I'm supposed to feel like during it. So maybe I'm raining back a little bit. And then afterwards it's like, Oh man, like I well, really left a lot out there. Well, that's the classic challenge, right? You you go into yeah. a 24 hour event and you're prepared for it. What you don't want to do is you don't want to fall apart during it. You have a, you have teammate expectations. Now, who did you do that race with? Who was on your team? Um, so I technically did it solo, but um, I had a couple other friends who were doing it, so we all kind of hung out together. I know that that's not the most couth way to do things now. Now I know that, but um, for my first race, I'm pretty happy that I did that. Um, So those are a couple guys that work in the same office that I do. And, um, we, they're good mountain biking buddies and guys that taught me how to ride. Really. (laughs) It it sounds like you kind of work in the coolest office in the world. Yeah. I mean, they're they're (laughs) really rad people. (laughs) Well, I don't technically work in the office now. I work from home, but still with the same guys. You still kind of get it right. They're still out there. (laughs) So you, you go with that first race. How did you come across Shenandoah Epic, like what was, what walked you into that race and, and how did you feel? And if I had this correct, if I'm wrong, please tell me your first race was a 24 hour race. You didn't go six hours or eight hours. You jumped right into a 24 hour race. Do I understand that correctly? That's correct. Like uh, aside from the road rates that I had previously mentioned, right. um, gosh, I think that I had just followed adventure enablers on um, social media of some sort, yes. Facebook or 
Instagram. And then I don't, I think that it just happened to be the most well-timed social media post that they ever could have done. I think that like, at that point I was just like looking for something. I think we all were looking for something right. during that time right. and it, it like came across and I was like, well, and I, Again, I had recently watched Eco Challenge Fiji and was just like, it was just uh, serendipitous almost where it was like, I got to sign up for this. And so I did. And that gave me something to focus a lot of time and energy on. And that, and that's a big thing to, so when you signed up for the race, it was the longest race. It was the, you, you had the row gains and the row gains for those who are out there listening, row gains are navigational races in which uh, a map is used to find a series of checkpoints in the woods at your own choice that so you go in a certain direction. Event racing is that, but larger because we have different different disciplines, right? We have we have paddling built in, and we have, we have uh, trekking, we have mountain biking, we have other disciplines that play a role in that. How did you make the transition coming over from the navigation from someone going from with row gains into navigation for a twenty four hour race with multiple disciplines? Oh man, I'll preface that with like I am not, and nor I would I say anybody that that in my office that we did those road games with, like none of us were like savants in the navigation area. Um, I, that's something I've been working on really hard over the past year, once I've gotten serious about the sport, but, um, yeah, it's completely different, like navigating on a bike and just like, that just adds it a whole other level though. It's sometimes a little bit easier due to like most of it being fire roads or uh, trail you can easily identify like trail crossings and stuff like that. Um, navigation on foot, as I said, is something that I've been working on. I just feel like regardless of whatever team I'm on, um, I may not be the primary navigator, but like it, it's important for me to at least know how you never know what kind of circumstance is going to come your way. So it's something that I work on and that it's probably um, what I've worked on the hardest since I've gotten into adventure racing. So clearly you found that the navigation was an area of you needed improvement. It's worth your while to keep your head in the map, right? Even if you're not the primary navigator. So when you say you're working on it now, now that you're, you're technically in the off season, what are you doing to work on that? Um, currently not much, but I mean, like, so the, one of the last bigger races I did, which I saw you there was Stockville. And I, I went with a buddy of mine and both of us are very even level nav. And like, we kind of took turns and split the roles. Um, and I mean, I was at that same race the previous year and just, uh, the, the amount of progress that I've made over a year, it was just like, I felt like this year's stock bill was a little bit tangible for that, where it was just like, whoa, you know, like I found myself in some really good company sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. like where it's like, I might be doing something right. Or like, we might, we might be really sort of getting this dialed in. Um, I love looking at the maps afterwards, like, uh, Mark Lathansi just sent information for Winter Wildcat coming up. And so today I was looking at routes from last year and just um, trying to improve just overall intelligence and knowledge of reading terrain and selecting the best routes possible. I like, man, I, there's sometimes where I cover all the miles in the world and I still don't clear a course because, you know, my route was trash you well, know <laughs> and that's that's come up before on the show where where someone will will, will talk about how they're they're very fast at moving over terrain and they have no problem doing that but, but that they fall into a trap though because they move so quickly they're a little bit lazy on their navigation and they travel so much further than everybody else and their speed is a benefit is also a handicap because when you're not as fast as someone like that you have to be thoughtful about your route choice and i and i think that's the challenge and i like how you mentioned you went from stockville in two consecutive years because when you when you do an event you know year after year you get a sense of your growth over time right and so from your first stockville experience to your second you felt that you had, you had grown as a navigator and that's a really good feeling because adventure racing is a is a is a quick path to improvement right it's nice to feel you you get better over time pretty quickly to your point navigation was one example of that yeah with with, with, with that navigation with that work that you have there do you do you augment that outside of races with example the watching of videos do you go to orienteering clubs have you considered things like that yeah 
Um, so I always do a lot of post-race uh, research, especially if uh, the data is available, which we're really lucky. I, I imagine that there was a time when you didn't have live trackers for every event and you weren't able to go back and look through that. Um, so I do a lot of that. Uh, there is the Northeast Ohio Orienteering Club I participate in sometimes. Um, and mostly I just like be playing in the woods and looking at maps. Well, and, that's, and that's what this time of the year is really nice for, because there's even here in, in I'm in northern New Jersey, southern New York State, uh, Hudson Valley Orienteering Club puts out a series of winter uh, free to use maps in the woods for the and checkpoints in the winter. You could download the maps, print them out, and you could spend six hours if you want out in the woods on your own with a map at hand. And I think you really exemplify a large growth point for a lot of people getting a map in your hand, getting in the woods, spending time walking around, learning to read terrain is a huge thing to do because when you feel comfortable with the map in your hand, it lowers the mental stress of the race, which then gives you more physical ability as you're out there. Yes, I, I agree with that 100%. So I'm trying to be better in all realms. So it, it sounds like you look at adventure racing as in many ways as a puzzle to be solved. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do. I, I look at adventure racing and it's, I, I want to race at a high level. And in order to do that, there are a lot of different things going on. So yes, I need to be strong physically. I need to have the mental aptitude to be able to read a map. If I have to, I also have to be, um, just have some like fortitude and humility and patience and diligence and be a good teammate. And like all of those facets are things that like, not only are they going to serve me well on a team or as a teammate, but like they serve me well just in my life. And so one of the things that I really appreciate about adventure racing is how I feel when I leave a course or I leave a long race, especially like an expedition race where it's just like, I, I just feel like I grow in some way every time that I do it. Like, I don't know if that makes any sense to anybody well, else. Well, but well, no, well, it makes complete sense when you talk about it, because what you're saying is, is that when all those systems have to be used simultaneously, right? The physical capacity to do the race, the mental capacity to, to be in the maps to be with a teammate those teammate dynamics the food all those things when those systems all come together it's an it's an incredible challenge and then if you extend that over the course of days right if you go five days it's almost like it's almost like hockey stick growth for personal growth right you you go straight up and you leave that race a different person than you went in do i, yes. do I capture that i capture what you were saying there correctly yeah, that's exactly how I feel. Like I'm never the same person when I leave those events. You you come into the sport with with a sense of experience. You know, major races you've done. You've done the road games at work. You've you brought your bike across the country. You came in solo, and then you transitioned over to to some teammates. The the solo dynamic and the teammate dynamic are two separate things. What adjustments did you have to make to find yourself to be a good teammate during a race? Oh my goodness. Uh, so many. And I, it's something that I am really striving to be better at this coming year because, um, be, like I said, I do kind of come from like a solo background and it, it wasn't until I've, I've done a couple races with birth barf racing and I, I plan to do a couple more with them in the coming year, but it was just like, they have really taught me a lot about being a good teammate as far as like, you know, like if somebody's really struggling, like, me two years ago would have been like, oh man, that's a bummer. You're really struggling, you know, but like me now is like, what is it that I can do to alleviate whatever situation you're going in? If it's, you know, let me take some weight off your pack or let me even carry your pack or let me tow or let me tell a joke or whatever it may be, give you a snack. Um, so I want to be better at that. And I want to be better with just like, uh, overall, just sensing that from my teammates and not having to ask those questions. Cause sometimes those, those questions are hard to hear from people for the people that are in, in it, you know, like. It's almost having like a sense of ESP that when you're in the, you're in the race, you're looking around and you realize that that teammate is a little bit quieter towards the back, not as chatty as they were. You begin thinking to yourself, like, 
uh oh, like the, you kind of go from green to yellow a bit. Like it's so and so okay. You yeah. mentioned their names, and I want to give them a shout out because they are wonderful to the sport. You mentioned Burf Barf Racing. Um, yes, they are a fantastic podcast to listen to. BRF and then Barf, as if like you know the food's leaving your stomach. They are uh, incredible adventure racers, and I've had a chance to race with them, and they've been integral with the podcast. So I appreciate you calling them out, and I do agree with you that in their podcast, they talk a lot about the solidarity that comes from being on a team and being good to your teammates. Yes. I mean, I, all the praises for Barf, like racing with them has kind of, it, it's a different experience racing on an all women's team, but like, man, the fun we have, but also just like the cohesiveness of the team. So they're fun, they're funny or whatever, but like that should not take away with how gritty those girls yeah. are either. And I like, I just love and respect yeah. them so much. They, they epitomize and, and, and it reminds myself is that they take the race seriously, they don't take themselves seriously. Yes. Yeah, and they're, and they're great. So shout out to Burf Barf. <laughs> Heck, you, you sound like your sponsors of the Dark Zone, Burf Barf, the way I'm talking about you, so great <laughs> job. You mentioned how you evolved as a teammate, that at one point you would have looked at the person and been like, oh, that person's suffering to where like, I want to help this person now. How did you, besides being in race experiences, where did you see that come alive in a race? Did someone model that for you? Or did you realize that I need to learn to be better from, with my teammates? I think a little bit of both. Um, one of the other incredible things about adventure racing is that like you're only as strong as everybody on your team. So um, in order for whatever team I'm going to be on to be successful, however you measure success or whatever, everybody on the team needs to be taken care of. Um, so just recognizing that and also having some experience with that, uh, with racing with Burf Barf, but, you know, I raced with Bend at nationals this year and just like, they live that to a T like, there, there is no individual on their team, like whatever they have to do to move as fast and efficiently as a team, like that's, that's what you have to do. And you tell our listeners the story of how you got involved in Bend for nationals. Oh boy. <laughs> um, so I have this habit of just saying yes all the time and just. <laughs> <laughs> Which is by the way, is a, is a very, very common ailment benefit adventure racers. It's like, do yeah. you want to? And before they say what it is, someone's going, I'm in. So yeah. you're, you say yes a whole lot. So how did that work out with Bend? Oh boy. So um, they had posted either on the women of AR or maybe just on the adventure race teammate finder or whatever, that their female for nationals had gotten hurt in a mountain biking injury and they were looking for a female to take their spot. And um, a few people had mentioned my name and I'm a big fan of shooting your shot. So I was like, Okay. Like, so I got like when Jason and I talked and I'm like, I obviously, I don't have the experience that they do or the success that they do, but I, I am super gritty and I, I just didn't feel like I could pass up an opportunity to race with some of the best if they would have me. Um, so that conversation went basically like that. I told him that exact same thing, told him that like, I'd be willing to leave it all out there. And, uh, they said, okay. And so I met them. So this conversation happened six days before nationals. And, and who was your third teammate? M Max King, okay. which I'm, I, I knew of Jason Magnus, obviously being like just completely engulfed in the adventure racing community, but, um, I did not know Max King and I'm thankful for that. Cause I think I may have been a little bit more intimidated had I known him. Um, but yeah, it ended up working out great. So six days before, and then I met them like the Thursday, right before check-in. We went on a quick ride and a quick run and checked in and that's and, that. And, 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 and finish the story. How did you do at Nationals? Uh, we ended up placing second, which was pretty incredible. Did, so. you, did you have that going into the race? Well, first off, I mean, how cool, by the way, is our sport that you meet your two new teammates basically the day before the race, you ride a little bit and then bam, you're in the national championship. <laughs> you, I mean, I mean, great. You came in second in that experience. Did now it was a 30 hour race. I'm correct. Yes. So yep. in, inside that, that 30 hour window, cause you didn't take 30 hours on the course inside that 30 hour window. How did the event go for you? Walk us through the race a little bit. 
and, and specifically focus in on when did it get hard for you? What was the challenge that you had to fight through? Oh, the hardest part of the whole race for me was in the first hour um, running up that mountain. So elevation, like the altitude, like really took well, its toll well, on you me. Live at, you live at sea level, right? You're, you're in Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah just so, a little bit higher. Right, exactly. Right. Not exactly. And then you had to go out to California. And so right away, you're, you're, you're oh. a lowland, you're running up a hill. Oh man. Yeah. And I'm running up the hill behind Max King, who is like a renowned ultra runner, mountain runner, in which I had no idea. So uh, we were going a lot faster than I ever would have ran up that hill. Um, so that was like, I think it took us about an hour to get up to the top of Mammoth Mountain. And it was like I said, the most miserable I was for the whole day, but um, I was feeling pretty good once I got on that bike. <laughs> right, because so the bike's already up there. So you got yeah, to the top. Yeah, we stationed bikes the night before. And it came down the other side. How would you do with the technical level of the mountain biking? Oh, I loved it. Okay. Is yeah. that is that part of your skill set? Uh, I would say so. Um, I, I Again, I'm still fairly new to the sport, but in multi-sport adventure races, um, I have noticed that, Mountain biking, aside from navigating, mountain biking seems to be uh, a barrier for a lot of people. And right. it's just a skill that I've developed on my own prior to getting into AR. So I would agree with that. I in, in my the race reports I read about nationals and what I had what I'd seen and what we saw in the video was the the the, the race organizer, to to his point, Ishai really talked a lot about the technical nature of the descent because he wanted to make sure that people were well warned about how hard it was gonna be coming off the mountain. But in retrospect, people said that his warnings were appropriate, but it was much more rideable than than they thought it would be. Yes, I would agree yeah. with that. Yeah. And thank you for having him on. Like within that six days that I learned I was racing nationals, I'd listened to that podcast at least probably three times. <laughs> well, well, that, well, well, then you're the person. And the reason I know that is, is that that podcast became one of the most popular listened to podcasts we had. And I think it was because people such as you wanted to get a sense of what the course was going to be like. Oh, yeah. Also, your first time racing in conditions such as that, high and dry. Yes. Yep. Okay. So, how did you how did you do with that? I mean, obviously, the elevation was one thing. Well, let's let's pause for a second. We talked about systems before, right? Physical, yeah. mental, teammates. Six days before the race, you talk to them. You meet them on the Thursday. You're running uphill with them all of a sudden before you realize it, and you're in the middle of a race. How did all those systems connect? Like, where was it? The, where was it the hardest? Oh man. Um, honestly, like. It was, it all felt a little seamless. Like it all felt like it was, I was supposed to be there. That's what it felt like. Right. Um, yeah. The race was physically hard, of course, but um, Jason and Max were incredible to work with. And just, I mean, what an opportunity for me to race with a team at that caliber too. Right. So like, I kind of went into it just like, man, like just be grateful for this opportunity and treat the whole race as, race as such right. like right. race hard but when time, if there's a low point or if there's anything that's not going our way, but just like recognize the opportunity and like, don't take it for granted. Gotcha. And as soon as that door opened up, you ran right through it, right? The, yeah. it all worked out. You were able to, to get off from work. You were able to get out there and it all came together and, and off you go. Yep. How did it feel being at the pointy end of the race? Uh, I felt pretty good. <laughs> so so walk, walk us through the, di so tell us the podium one, two, and three, and how close are you to first? Um, so Toyota Tundra took first and they were a lot farther from us. Like I think over an hour maybe, yeah. um, than we were from the third place team, which was team vert. Um, I think they were only like 10 to 15 minutes behind us. So we had spent most of the second half in the race, just yo-yoing with them. So, um, yeah. And, um, at the end of that race, I was having like really awful, like lung issues. And so we got out of the last boat and there's a 5k to the end. And we know that they're close behind, but like, it was, I could hardly run at that point. Cause I was having a hard time, like breathing and stuff. So like we were doing, you know, every other telephone pole run and then catch your breath, run, catch your breath. So I don't know if, you know, if that last section would have been a little bit longer, maybe they would have caught us. I don't know how they were feeling. I know somebody from Toyota Tundra was, I think one of their guys were struggling in the lung department too, but. Well, I mean, very hot, very dry, very dusty. Yeah, it yeah. was, it was something, but it was 
awesome. <laughs> I'll do great. it again in a second. <laughs> so, so, so that was so that's how you 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 had your season. But I actually saw you earlier in the year. You also raced the Endless Mountains Adventure Race. Am I correct? Yes, I was yes. there. Is that with Team Texas Pride? Yes. So you guys had quite the interesting experience going in Texas Pride. It was you had some very early race excitement. What happened in the beginning of the race with your teammate? Oh my gosh, this race had all of the excitement within the first six hours, I guess. <laughs> so so for um, the listeners that are out there, Endless Mountains Adventure Race is put in by Rootstock Racing. It was held in Clarion, Pennsylvania, was a, a, in Western PA, was the host city. And it was the first edition of this. And Amanda signed on with Team um, Texas Pride. Was it your first five-day race, Amanda? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I found out like five days, five, not five days, that's nationals. Five weeks prior to, they were looking, their female um, had gotten an injury or something. And then so they kind of threw it out there. I had, again, met them the day of check-in. And <laughs> then we were going to go spend five days together in the woods. And we, so it's a 120 hour race. And within the first six hours, one of the members, he was having like heat, I think heat related stuff. And he, he eventually found some stuff out later from, um, the medical community about he maybe had some un underlying condition that, uh, wasn't realized until he was out there pushing himself like he was. So, so after the first six hours, the one member had to be medically removed and um, Rootstock allowed us to continue unofficially. So, so and, all of a sudden your race became one big learning experience. You had, yes. You had, right. You had 114 hours left to, to spend some time out there and figure out the, the, the really deep end of adventure racing. Yes. And, you know, I look back on that and I don't know how the race would have been otherwise had that not happened. But I think the experience for me was exactly what it needed to be for me to uh, dip my toes into it. And I ended that race the same way I ended my first Shenandoah Epic. Like, I have so much more to give to it. Like, um, but I think for being my first and not really knowing what to expect, I think I was we as a team were kind of dealt a lot of different, um, hands. We, uh, we had, we had so many trials. It's almost like comical, um, which I think is pretty common in adventure racing. Like, you know, there's tons of things that could possibly go wrong. And I just feel like they were all doing that for us. Um, we had one member. So shortly after the first member was medically evacuated, um, another member on the first pack raft leg, he had, broken or dislocated his collarbone shoulder or something right which uh kudos to him his name's matt and he continued that whole pack rafting leg and didn't say anything to us until we were out of the boat and he was like what does this look like and it's like oh <laughs> it doesn't look good but he finished the race and he did it like he was he was so strong and helped tow um when he needed and like he he's he was an incredible teammate um and then the the other guy he struggled with heat related issues almost every day of the race and you know like it was it was a big feat to cross that finish line and then we're 10 miles from getting to the finish line and then our boat gets a hole in it and it starts to sink and then we <laughs> half of our boats at the bottom of the river. We're digging it out. We're in an area where we can't, there's nowhere to park on the sides of the river. And uh, so we had to MacGyver our boat twice. We did it once and then water bailed a lot. And then the second time we really had to put some thought to it. And um, we, the, the thing about adventure racing also is just the community. So some, there was another team passed as a roll of Tyvek tape and we uh, melted like an oatmeal cap and had a bike tube patch that we had melted and then we use like the oatmeal um as a skid plate and just every inch of tape we had on us we just did whatever we could to get that boat to the end of the race and uh we did it we uh we ended up crossing the finish line with like eight minutes to spare early in the race because things went so upside down so quickly for your team did you feel that having such an early race calamity helped you mentally because a lot of the pressure was off because you were going forward unofficial and you had now had the four and a half days in front of you to figure it out i'm i'm honestly not sure about that because i i kind of took it the other way i think where it's like because we were racing unofficially, I felt like it made the, de the decision to like drop points or whatever, just easier because it's Got like, it. oh. that's a really good point. Cause you felt like, cause the, cause the stakes were different now. And because you, no matter what happened, you were going to be behind other teams. 
It made it easier for you to make decisions. Hence, when the race ended, you felt like you left a lot out there. Yes. I got it. Okay. Okay. So that, that, that's that's a double-edged sword. That in one yeah. way, you were you, because you were free, in reality, you, you kind of didn't have as great an experience because the pressure of hitting those mandatory checkpoints was off you because no matter what happened, it was what it was. Yep. So was that your... So was that your only five day race so far? Yep. You are. Okay. And then I, I'm doing two more next year. Which what, what were those two? I will be at Expedition Ozark with Burf Barf, and we'll be at Endless Mountains again with no complaints. Oh, that, those are great teammates right there. Holy yeah, cow. I'm excited oh, to yeah. race with those guys. Wow, that's a really, that, both of them, I mean, both Burf Barf and no complaints. That's a great, that's a great. So what do you, so right now, for those of you listening at home, it's December 13th, 2022. Um, Amanda is, is at home now, right? The winter is just about on top of us. What are you doing to get ready for those two big races? What does your winter training look like? Oh, come, I kind of like, just like we talked about earlier, just kind of do whatever I feel like in this season, like be like between November, like Thanksgiving and Christmas, let's call it, I call it my fire season where I like to find what feels good. If I uh, want to go out for a 10 mile run, then I'll do it. But if I don't want to, I won't do it. And then, uh, but I always maintain some level of fitness and then uh, come after the first of the year, I, I get into a more regimented training schedules. My friends call me psychos. Um, (laughs) Do do you work with a coach? I do not. Um, At a, a gym, but uh, so no, I, I do not work with a coach. It's something I probably should look into. And, yeah, and I think I think what I, I think more often than not, and not that it's a rule for everybody, I would be willing to argue that people are more likely to find their the upper level of their of their athletic ability when they work with a good coach. That's not for everybody, but I've seen that time and time again. Having that kind of you know, we've had Jen Seger on the on the podcast. Alyssa mm-hmm. Gadeski is a great coach out there. Um, and what they do, I think, for the most part, is having a coach, they, they become the brain outside your body where you mm. get a plan and your job is to follow the plan. And I have spoken to adventure racers who talk about the idea that getting that weekly plan, this makes it easier to check off those that training session. It takes the thinking out on your part. And next thing you know, you find yourself getting much stronger, much fitter along the way. Um, yeah, and that so, may be the next level for me to take if I if I want to pursue adventure racing like I plan to. So you say like you plan to. So you have you have two five day races on your schedule, right? But yep. both of those races, by the way, are are stateside, right? Ozark, which is a a newer race down in uh, Bentonville, Arkansas, going to be a great event. And Endless Mountains back for round two out of Williamsport. Those are two races on the eastern coast of America. I know Arkansas is not the east, but you know what I mean. Um, what else? What else? Potential wise, what do you really want to? What boxes do you want to check? Um, I would like to be at nationals again this year on a competitive team. I don't know what that looks like yet, but I hope that that happens again. But once again, that's another East Coast race. That's in Vermont this year. I know. What about Jimara? I need to get out to some mountains, eh? I was just in West Texas just for a buddy's birthday, and like uh, it was similar, like arid and bigger mountains when you get closer to Mexico, we were in like Trilingua area and it, it was fun just to play on some mountains again. But again, I'm in the time where I'm just playing and not highly focused on something. Um, I like with nationals this year, being out in California, it seemed that it was mostly like mid Atlantic teams or East coast teams that had traveled out there. So um, maybe you can educate me on other available races out there because it, like I'm from Ohio. So, you know, the Virginia and the East coast and Pennsylvania, like that appeals to me because I can, I can weaken that and not have to be a big ordeal and not have to take a ton of time off work and those things. So if there's something that I'm not seeing that's out West, then I would be happy to learn of it. Well, one thing we're seeing now too, is that we're seeing, and, and I'm going to dig a bit more into this. I'm going to get Heidi Muller back on the podcast. She's the CEO of Adventure Racing World Series. It feels like they are adding more and more races all the time to the ARWS calendar. Like today they brought on La Ruta down in Mexico, which like that's in November. That looks to be an amazing race, like five days racing in November in Mexico. Like if I'm free, count me in for races such as that. Um, you know, you know, Expedition um, Oregon is taking a break this year. You know, you know, Jason, your teammate is this year. They they have nine other races going on, but not a big five day race. Canada is always there with Natalie Long. Um, so there's a lot of great races out there. And then of course you have the whole slate of races that are happening. Like Faroe Island is happening this year, um, which is going to be a great race. And obviously the World Championships is going to be in Africa. It's on the East Coast. Uh, um, so there's a lot there for you to consider. It sounds like you're just line me up, coach. Like find me a race and let me go and go get them. Am I am I hearing you correctly on that? 
Uh, I think you're right about that. Yeah, uh, there'll be. I, although I will say, um, I I still have so much to learn, and I'm still very much a novice in the sport. But I uh, I don't think that I want to invest. You know, adventure racing is expensive and it's time consuming, and it's so time and resources to go dink around in the woods. I think those days are done for me. Like if I do it, I want to do it. Like I gotcha. want to. I you, want got to go t- out. you got a taste of it now. You got a taste. And so you want to go yeah. big if you're going to do stuff. I got it. Well, yeah. And it's just, you know, like I talked earlier about like the feelings I have when I, when I don't race like that afterwards, where I just like, I just, I get pretty haunted and bummed about it if I leave too much out there. So, gotcha. um, if I'm, if I'm going to do a race, I really want to show up and do it. So, so walk me through the thought process of you, you say that you still have a lot to learn. What, what, what is that? What is, what is, what do you think? What's the Delta? What do you have to close in your growth? And the reason I asked that question is, is there's people are probably listening to the podcast right now who are dipping their toes in the water, want to get better at adventure racing. Here you are now, you're second at nationals. You've done a five day race. You have two more coming this year. What is your, what's the separation between what, where you are and what you want to be? Oh boy. I, I think that it's one of the appeals of adventure racing to me is the fact that like, I, I can't put a finger on that. Like I can't put a finger on an end result for me. Um, I feel like even the best of them can go out on a course and get turned around and, you know, like, uh, and I love that. And I love that sense of adventure that comes with that. Like I can be as honed in on every skill in the world and weather conditions or rain or one silly mistake on a bearing or, you know, anything can come in and flip your race upside down as I learned in my first expedition race. So my goals are just to be as uh, ready as possible and, hopefully though i don't know that i'll ever find that in mark hopefully at one point i'll get to the point where i'm like okay i'm a strong racer like that's what i want to be like i don't want to just although i always say yes but like i i want to be a reliable racer where people know that if i'm going to show up then there should be no question about what i've put into being prepared for the race and so along the way you, you recognize and this is what makes adventure racing so enticing so many people is that there's that that wonderfully chaotic nature of the race, where when the race starts and it's you and your teammates and it's the maps and your equipment, anything from point A to point B could happen, right? And that could be, and there's a 120 hour window sometimes, and there's an eight hour window or a six hour window, whatever it is. It sounds like you're in love with the idea of creating this environment in which you have to test yourself inside that environment and see what happens alongside you and your teammates and your gear and your training. It sounds like that that's really the, the appeal that the sport has for you. Yeah, absolutely. And this may sound a little silly, but I oftentimes get sad that there's not really any more like, like the times of true exploration are over, you know, like aside from like space or, you know, super, super desolate areas. But, and so, and I also have a tendency to be, I wouldn't say chaotic, but maybe a little erratic where like, yeah, I just say yes to everything. And I feel like adventure racing provides just enough of both of those things. So it it makes me feel um, primal in a way that I'm out there and I'm doing whatever it takes to get from point A to point B, but it also is providing me some sort of structure to get all my crazy out, you know, (laughs) like, no, no, I think, I think you're spot on. You know, we, the the episode we just released was with David Webster and he did, uh, uh, he did Scotland, he did Iterra and he was on team ACDC AR and his first adventure race was a five day adventure race. He'd never done one previously. Um, and he, you know, he's got great episode. He has the British accent going. And on that episode, we talked a little bit about how he felt a connection to the great British tradition of being an explorer, where the British went and they did things and they and they and there was a big world that they wanted to go find out and they wanted to go look into and they wanted to learn more about the British Geographic Society and all of those things, right? The Royal Geographic Society. And I think that there's there's echoes of that ethic that exists in adventure racing. And if you go back and if you if you if you watch the the documentaries about the early days of AR, it was like, literally, it was like, here's, here's a 10 day window and there's like seven checkpoints and here's a map and good luck and groups of people. And to the credit of our, of our, of our, our forebears, the fact that they made it a multi-gender sport. Thank you for doing that. Right. Cause, cause we have, we have to have multi-gender teams. They just set off into the wilderness and they had these amazing adventures 
and were like the the descendants, were the grandchildren and the grandchildren and the great grandchildren of those races. And I think that that appeals to you, if I hear you correctly, when you talk a bit about that. Yes, absolutely. That appeals to me. Um, yeah. I and mean, just like I talked a little bit about it earlier, but like there's just something about being disconnected and relying on your own skills and relying on your own instincts. It, it's just a, it's a really empowering feeling when you make it to the other side of that. And again, you just come out a different person. You grow. You grow and you grow and you grow. Well, what you what you do is and and, and Grant Killian, you know, my who's my the, the Moby Dick, the white whale of guests of mine, Grant, you will be on the show eventually. You've told me you would be, and I'm gonna hunt you down. Is what he would talk about with with, with Untamed New England is you first off you talk about contrived inconveniences. Like we would do this to ourselves, right? You you don't get to complain during adventure race because you you paid good money to be here and you agreed for it to be hard. So you don't get to carry on about how hard the race is. Because if not, you should never should have signed on. That's one thing. But then also the idea that we create inside this time window a community, a temporary community of 35 teams, four racers per team, 120 hours of racing, or six hours or eight hours or 12 hours, whatever it is, 24 hours. And inside that time window, we move as a society through that time window, and then everyone's on the other side of it. And I'd be willing to bet, Amanda, I'm going to read your mind, and I might be guilty of leading the witness with this question. I bet you love the post race stand around catch up with all the other racers talking oh, about the race. <laughs> I love it. And you know what else I love is just that post race feeling of depletion. Like just like there's nothing else. I'm with like-minded people. They all just had the same experience as me. And so, yeah, that post race just chatting with everybody and like comparing certain routes and or just being just so tired and just all stoked together on what you just achieved. Like it is, it's potent. It's and potent. I it's live powerful. For it. It's a powerful, powerful yes. thing. You know, and uh, one of my favorite podcasts is the Normal Cast. Um, it's it's by Chris Kalus. It's a climbing podcast. I'm not a climber as much as I want to be, but he brings on these, uh, um, Alex Honnold was just on and he brings on these amazing, Steve Swenson was on these amazing climbers. And they talk about how climbing, they do these big efforts, right? They go in the mountains for five, 10, 15 days, and they, they, they climb these massive cliff face and amazing stuff. And they say at the end, it's war, sto- it's war, it's war stories without the war. Yes. That in, and I, and I think that we see that in adventure racing, that when you're shoulder to shoulder with the team and you, you have that lived experience, once again, agnostic to the distance, you create that common bond of everybody who did that together. And without that bond, People just don't get it. It's really hard to explain adventure racing to non-adventure racers. Yes, I agree. I try to all the time. Um, yeah, I love what you said. It's like it's the war without the war. And we all are really, I always say how fortunate I am to be able to choose suffering for fun. Um, right, right. And, but it's exactly like what you said. Like when you overcome things like hardships and whatever the race is going to throw your way. But like when you overcome that with people who had to go through the same thing, like it just, you're bonded in a different way for yeah. sure. And I, and I, I agree. I think there's a use the word primal before. I think there's a primal aspect to it. I think that's part of it. The, 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 you know, um, you know, at 10,000, 15,000 years ago, some cave dweller looked and said, oh, what's on the other side of that hill? Right. We're, we're an exploring species or exploring creature. I also think it's interesting when you talked about your, your, your propensity to say yes to everything. I think in reality, what, what you, by doing that, what, you, what you're doing is you're, you're telling the world, telling yourself that you believe that you have strong potential because you wouldn't say yes if you think you couldn't do it. And there's an incredible level of benefit to, to anybody emotionally and, and internally when they're willing to say yes, because they're willing to say that I have the ability to do this. It's going to be hard. Don't get me wrong. There's going to be suffering, but I'm going to vote for myself by saying yes to this. Yeah. I, I, I hope that it's not coming off arrogant when I say this, but I have the tendency to think that if somebody has done it, then I could probably do it too. put it after putting an effort and work and getting myself. Right. right. It doesn't happen by accident. It happens because you, you out there and you'll, you'll train, you know, yeah. as, your, as your friends, your friends are hanging out and you're out there running laps, right? You're, you've, you've earned the right to be there. Yeah. If somebody's done it, then I don't feel like there's any reason why I can't, if I'm willing to put in the work. So 
aside from the, the, the two big five day races you have coming up, are there any other places that you, if you could pick a spot to go race, if you wanted to go anywhere in the world, where would you want to put an adventure race on and check it out? Big question. I know I get it. Big question. It's so huge. I mean, I Terra looked incredible last year. Um, there, uh, I did get asked to race in Croatia in May, but it ended up just not working out everywhere. Really. Uh, Africa looks like it would be incredible. Um, I, I think that I would be challenged in a different way in like a jungle-ish setting. So uh, maybe somewhere in South America someday. I think that that just brings its own challenges because of the weather and the, and just nature in general down there. Um, but yeah, I, I uh, you don't I'm care, a, right? You don't I care. I don't care. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad, but right. sign me up. If you're sitting on the couch and the bus pulls up, you're getting on it. You don't know where it's Probably. going. Yeah, bag's <laughs> packed already. Let's go. <laughs> so, uh, in in closing, there are going to be people listening to this episode who 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 are toying with the idea of adventure racing. Clearly, your 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 willingness to dive into it right away says a lot about it. But what words would you give? to the aspiring racer, what mindset should they have going into their earlier races? My biggest advice would be to ha- have some confidence in yourself and not be afraid to try something new and set your expectations for what you think you're capable of. Um, so if that's just like, man, I don't think that I can move my body for six hours. Well, you're not going to know that unless you try it and find out. Um, and you know, set reasonable goals, but like I mentioned before, like I'm a big, big encourager, like encourager of people to just, you know, I call it shooting your shot, just shoot your shot. Like you're never going to know what's on the other side of it unless you try. And if, and if you're serious about it and you're willing to put in some work, then like, if you set the goal, you're going to achieve it. You're going to, if the goal is just to make it to the end of the race, like you're going to do it, but you can't do it unless you try. Also, for any women out there, tell them to uh, join the Women of AR Adventure Racing Group on Facebook because Stephanie Ross is everything. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and on that note, I will, and I appreciate the plug for the Women of AR. Um, it's been a, it's been a pleasure to see the strong growth that's come in the sport, especially with women, all women teams, right, and women podiums. And I know that a lot of the race directors, and I want to call it Rootstock Racing for this. Um, mm-hmm. they've really made it the point that, that a core definition to equality and diversity inside sport is, is what they do and what in us ARA is trying to do. So I, I thank you for that shout out. And I thank you for being here, Amanda and have a fantastic training racing and good luck wherever you end up racing. All right. Thanks, Brian. Well, there you have it folks. Episode number 86 of the dark zone. Thank you to Amanda for being on the show. Thank you to all of you for stepping into the time machine and going back in time to December 2022 and listening to her episode. Like I said, she was a great interviewee. I look forward to having her on again. Her horizons are bright when it comes to adventure racing, and I am proud to race alongside her. Admittedly, alongside his relative, she's a lot further down the course than I am, but still, it's great to see her on the course. Thank you for being here. I know you have a lot of places you could spend your time, and we're glad you're spending them with us at The Dark Zone. We will always remain free to the listeners. That will never change. If you like what you hear here, head over to the platform of your choice and give us a rating. The algorithm kind of likes that. Uh, The more people who rate us and click us and like us, the more the algorithm tells the world about us, and we are delighted that we get to share adventure racing with the world. Thanks for being here. Keep training, keep racing, and be safe. WKRP Got kind of tired of packing and unpacking Town to town, up and down the dial Maybe you and me were never meant to be Just maybe think of me once in a while Baby
baby, pay no mind The price for finding me was losing you Memories help me hide my lonesome feeling Far away from you and feeling low It's getting late, my friend, my love, I miss you so Take good care of you, I've gotta go Cincinnati